Hello and welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpot, program number 48 in our series in the book of Acts. Now, we have two stories, both of them fairly short. Uh, the first story is called Timothy joins Paul and Silas. And the second story, the Macedonian call. Uh, now, these seem like, uh, well, not so interesting, but you'd be surprised. Now, we're going to be talking about Timothy, a very interesting young man, about 20 years old at this point. And he's going to be joining Paul and Silas on what we call the second missionary journey of Paul. The first one was with he and Barnabas, gone to Cyprus and then up into um, Turkey, modern-day Turkey, then known as Asia. And uh, then we'd had the whole controversy about whether or not Gentiles, who were becoming Christians now, into this Jewish thing, whether they should be circumcised or not. Now, the decision of the early church was no. Uh, that's not necessary, but they wanted them to make sure that they did not become entangled in the immorality and the paganistic idolatry uh, that was ubiquitous in the culture of that period of time uh, and had, had been from the very beginning. Uh, they say one of the earliest religions uh, merged out of Siberia called shamanism about 10,000 plus years ago. And uh, I think that that is so. And I did some research on a book called Soul Journey, and I talk about shamanism, and very much, very much uh, prevalent today, too. In fact, it's one of the more rapidly growing religions, although most people don't know the name, and, but they are engaged in the practice thereof without really understanding it. Shamanism, the one who goes into the trance, the one who goes and has the visions, and is visited by spirit animals and other spiritual entities. Very popular today, very captivating, very addictive. So it, this is sort of the early church uh, events taking place around 50, 51 AD. And uh, <clears throat> so we begin the story in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. Now it says Paul. Now notice we continually have the word Paul, not Saul. Uh, Saul was his uh, Hebrew name. Paul would be his Greek name. They sound very much the same and did then too. Paul also came also to Derby and to, to Lystra. Now, what Paul and Silas are doing, they're going back and visiting some of the places that Paul and Barnabas had visited on this first missionary journey. Paul always liked to go back. Now, it, it is speculated, although not clearly stated, but speculated that the reason Paul did that is that the Judaizers, or the party of the Pharisees, had a habit of following after Paul. Paul would go to a city, he'd leave, the party of the Pharisees would come in uh, to disrupt. You think, is that a demonic activity? Well, very likely. Uh, because here would be Paul, Barnabas, and Silas preaching the message of Jesus, faith in him alone, and then the Judaizers would come along and say, okay, that's all right, but you've got to be circumcised, and you've got to obey the laws of Moses. You've got to keep kosher, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this would only cause trouble because Paul, Barnabas, and Saul had taught, no, it's by faith in Christ alone, grace alone, uh, very clear. So it would upset the, these churches. Here are these people that were from Jerusalem. Uh, they may have been wearing clothing uh, that were very religious looking, and their, their speech sounded, and they thought, well, you know, maybe we should. Maybe we should do these things. Uh, and so they would follow Paul around, and the first letter that Paul wrote right about this period in history is the book of Galatians. It's a letter to the Galatian church. Very interesting. Read that book, 
Uh, this, it's six chapters, take you about an hour to read it if you read slow like I do. And, uh, <clears throat> and you'll see that Paul has to counter the things that the Judaizers, the party of the Pharisees, are bringing in. Now, you can imagine if you're a carpenter, uh, you, one day you build a wall, you come back and somebody told, tore the wall down. If you're a plumber, you lay, you lay all the pipe one day, come back, and the pipe's been ripped up and stolen because it's copper. <laughs> I don't know, I just made that up. Anyway, um, so this is what they were being faced. And so Paul is, keeps going back and revisiting these churches. So Paul came to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. A disciple. Now, the early disciples were the apostles. Peter, and James, and John, and Philip, and Andrew, and Thomas, and all of those, all the 12. They were called disciples, and it means student. They were students. Uh, it was a very popular term to call uh, those who would sit under the feet of someone. Uh, Socrates had his disciples, Plato, Aristotle, and all of those, the great Greek and Roman teachers, they had the disciples. Well, the term was used. And they would learn from Jesus. And this is <clears throat> what is meant here. A disciple was there. He was learning about Jesus. Uh, how much material there was at that point point about what Jesus said and did? Don't know. Uh, we have strong evidence that Mark, who we talked about last week, who did not go with Paul and Silas, but with his cousin Barnabas because of the division between Paul, Paul and Barnabas. And by the way, Barnabas and Paul got to be friends again. Uh, there are several references in Paul's letters that show Paul and Barnabas had, had able to patch things up and everything was okay. So we know about that. However, um, uh, the situation is that the disciples, was Timothy, he uh, was a learner. And whatever materials they had, we don't know. Uh, we are aware of the oral tradition. We're aware uh, that there was likely a document that detailed or listed um, prophecies from the Hebrew Bible uh, that Jesus had fulfilled. There may have been a rudimentary doctrine called Q or Quelle from the German meaning source, a source of stories about Jesus that were a little, that were written down, but <coughs> part of the uh, old tradition about Jesus. We don't know. We have hints only. So, um, so here's Timothy. And he was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now, we know the name of his mother and his grandmother. <coughs> Paul's last communication, his last letter he wrote, was to Timothy. He was like an adopted son. Here's what he said in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 1. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice as well, I am sure dwells in you as well. So this is the person Paul wrote to last, <coughs> was his, his good friend Timothy. It is speculated that, that Luke is dead at this point, having completed the Gospel of Luke. Um, and so... He's a disciple. He wants to learn about Jesus. It's always the hallmark. Uh, I remember the Jesus people days when so many people were coming to know Jesus as Savior. They could not get enough. Could not get enough. Read the Bible. Sometimes too much. Have to tell them, you're spending all day long. You've got to go back to school. You've got to go to work. You just can't read the Bible all day long. Uh, and other good Christian literature that we would provide. They were just hungry. Hungry, hungry, and it's that hunger that always is the identifier, identifier of, of, of genuine con conversion. So the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Very interesting. Father was a Greek. 
Now that was against Jewish law. It would have been considered a, I hope you don't mind this word, uh, it was an inauthentic um, uh, marriage. Uh, the word I found in a commentator called a loser marriage. It wasn't going to work. It was considered anathema, really, you, you, for, in the Jewish mindset. Verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Remember, these are the, the cities in uh, southern Galatia that Paul visited the first missionary journey. Notice, well spoken of. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. I think I mentioned already that the young man was about 20 years old, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, it was Paul double-minded. He led, helped lead the charge against the party of the Pharisees who insisted on circumcising Gentiles. Now, here's half Jewish, half Greek. Paul wants to circumcise them. By the way, he didn't circumcise them himself. They were special people who did that, just as there are today. Now, it was a very um, important kind of a procedure and only undertaken uh, by, by the experts. And why did he do that? Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, see if I can find it here quickly. I maybe don't have it. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7. Um, now there's a passage where he says uh, about circumcision, nothing counts. Uh, 719, sorry to do this to you. It says, if, uh, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God, which should love God without our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Why does Paul go and do this? Wouldn't this set a bad example? Paul had, and this is my reasoning for why Paul did this. Paul had something more important in his mind. <clears throat> he wasn't concerned about the circumcision issue so much. In his mind, it had already been settled. The church at Jerusalem, now the church at Antioch, everybody was on board. Circumcision is not required of the Gentiles, nor to keep so many of the other uh, Jewish laws uh, that served really to be a yoke and difficult. What Paul's concerned about is evangelism. And he is pragma pragmatic. He knows that in this particular area, it's well known that Timothy's father was a Greek, uncircumcised. What, we've got a problem because Paul always presented the message of Jesus, the Messiah, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. He's always presented the message. He went to the synagogue. He preached to the Jewish people first, part of his MO. That's the way he did and so if he's taking along this, this, this fellow Timothy, and he, he's part Jewish, part Greek, and he's uncircumcised, and here he's with Paul and Silas, that could potentially be a problem. I think that was what is in Paul's mind. Luke doesn't tell us. <clears throat> you know, Luke doesn't say a lot of things to us. And it's one of the indicators that he has no, no concept that people many centuries later are going to be reading what he's written. He's doing it as a church historian. The, the Gospel of Luke is a letter telling about uh, who Jesus is, what he said, what he did, to people who are disciples, a kind of um, a manual for the school of Christianity, a textbook for the school of Christianity to help people grow up in Christ had no idea of inspired scripture, completely. Uh, and it's a good thing that he didn't have anything like that in mind, or the Gospels, Luke included, would be four, five, six times longer than they are, and filled with all kinds of stuff. God gives us what we need. That's how I view this. We look, we wish particularly, particularly in the book of Acts, 
we wish Paul had said more. But that was not his interest. He was looking to an audience beyond his death, perhaps, uh, an audience that uh, was just coming to faith in that era and giving an account, uh, thinking that this is something important to do, uh, especially when he saw uh, that Paul was going to be uh, executed by the Romans. So he provides a document that is adequate. We wish we had more. Then it says, verse 4, As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for, uh, uh, for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. He doesn't say anything about now... <coughs> Uh, we've got to fight the Judaizers. Uh, we've, we don't find Luke being using adversarial kind of language. Uh, he doesn't minimize or flatter, but he doesn't feel it necessary to get uh, involved in the controversies that were going on. When we read Galatians, <clears throat> And I think it's important for uh, all Christians to read the book of Galatians, Paul's last letter. Uh, I think you'll see what, what I'm trying to communicate. Verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. What we have going on here is what is called an awakening. I don't know how many awakenings occurred in the 20th century. I was a part of one called the Jesus People Movement, where in America alone, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people became followers of Jesus. This is becoming more and more evident as time goes on. And uh, I know a little bit about it because of two books that I have written on it called America's Awakenings, America's Awakenings and Jesus People Movement and the Memoirs of a Jesus Freak. And they continue to sell on Amazon every day. And so it was an awakening. It was the fourth time this had happened in America. So far in this 21st century, in America we have not seen an awakening. In fact, we've seen a major decline. And it's always the way. So I, my wife Katie said, uh, this is a pre-awakening time when the church is in decline. Uh, and maybe an awakening is coming. Many people are praying for it. But there's awakenings going someplace all, someplace in the globe uh, all the time. There have been thousands and thousands of them. Some have been national in scope. Uh, others have been local and small. Little, medium large, super big, mega, they go on all the time, where God's Holy Spirit is poured out and many people become Christians all at once. It's an astounding thing. I have the pleasure of studying this uh, for the last few decades. And uh, there have been many, probably the largest one that ever occurred took place in more recent years in China. And uh, so anyway, uh, so that's what's going on here. They increased in numbers daily. Uh, the, it was an awakening, a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit. Okay, the second story now is titled The Macedonian Call. Macedonia, let me explain that. I hope you've got a, bi you've got a map. You've got to have a map. Uh, maybe in the back of your Bible, a special one. If you don't have a map, let me know, I'll get you a map. Uh, or I'll tell you how to get one. But I, I got probably, if you contact me, I'll probably send you, I'll send you a map. Um, and it's fabulous to have them. You need to know about this. It helps to see it because this all took place in time and space. Now, how the Macedonian call, Greece. If you can picture the, uh, the country of Greece. The northern part of it is called Macedonia. The southern part of it is called Achaia. Macedonia, named for uh, the father of Alexander the Great, Philip II. That's where he was from, Macedonia. 
And so the area, northern Greece, becomes known as Macedonia. And you can see some of the cities that are there. And Philippi is going to be the one we're going to be looking at uh, next in the next program. So Macedonian call. Uh, there's going to be a man that looks like a Macedonian, easily identifiable as a, somebody from Macedonia, uh, by virtue of dress probably, uh, call, the Macedonian call, one of the great events, because what this means is the message of Jesus as preached by Paul and Silas for the first time is going to enter Europe because Greece is considered part of Europe. Turkey, that area, Galatia and so on, where Paul's first missionary journey is taking place, where they are at this, sta uh, at this stage of the game, that's Asia. Sometimes referred as Asia Minor, but it's east, the easternmost province of the Roman Empire. But it is not Europe, but they're going to go to Europe for the first time. Okay, so we pick up the story, Acts 16, verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Galatia, by the way, it was a tribe, a French tribe by the name of the Gauls, who at some period in history had traveled there uh, and had um, uh, settled there. So it became known as Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. <clears throat> who knows how that worked, how the Holy Spirit did that? We don't know. Was it a prophetic word? Was it um, an inner sense of things? Uh, was it obstacles? Uh, was it they're beset by too many enemies? Was a dangerous situation? We, we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. We don't know. Wish we knew. But for, forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Now remember that. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit. To speak the word in Asia. Wait a minute. I thought the Holy Spirit wants to present the gospel everywhere. That's the power of the Spirit. For some reason, God didn't want to continue in Asia. He had the apostles scheduled for Europe. And so that's the way it works. That's how I, how I interpret it. There's probably a dozen more different ways of looking at it. Verse 7, and when they, notice the word they, Luke is not there, but you just keep watching a little bit. It says, and when they had come up to Mycia, um, that's in the northwestern part of modern-day Turkey, then known as, Galatia, uh, as um, uh, Asia. Uh, when they had come up to Mycia, they attempted to go in Bithynia. Now, Bithynia is an area a little more to the central part, but north. Bithynia becomes a very important city, Christian city. It was in Bithynia in 325 that the Council of Nicaea was held, and it was in Bithynia that in 451 the Council of Chalcedon was held. So this became a major Christian center at, uh, a little bit later on called Bithynia. Now it says, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now notice the Spirit of Jesus now. Up here the Holy Spirit, same Spirit, not different. But the mystery of the Trinity is beyond explanation. I have wrestled with that for so long. Uh, and I, we also find, you see the spirit of Jesus, there's uh, at least two other places, or maybe one other place, maybe two, we find the term the spirit of Christ. So we have the spirit, Holy Spirit, spirit of Jesus, spirit of Christ. All the same thing. Remember the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one mind. One intention, one everything, one essence, one being. And we don't understand that. We have nothing in our world to look to to help us gain, the, gain an understanding of it. But that's, it's important to notice where the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. We don't know how that happened. So passing by Mycia, they went down to Troas... And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now Troas, Troas, I got my map out. That is a little seaport town 
where you can get a boat. And it's at Troas that it's possible that Luke joined them. So they're going to do it. He's, he pulls, sees a, a guy from Macedonia, has a vision, by the way. I, there is a mass movement where everybody thinks it's, you, you, you're getting visions and dreams. And people are recounting them and so excited. Oh, here's what God told me. I got a word from God. Let me tell you, that is so dangerous. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't have to stand against it, but I do. Very dangerous. Sweeping the world. It, these direct encounters with deity. Uh, just like shamanism. It's, it's just shamanism revisited. The dreams, the visions. Uh, speaking with the dead. Talking with angels. Angels talking to you. On and on. It's addictive, it's exciting, and it's dangerous, and it's a demonic nature. Uh, I'm not going to go into you how I know that is. I am just see that it is an unbiblical thing. But here it happened to Paul, okay? We don't know what it was exactly like. But anyway, it says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia. See, that's why I say that Paul likely encountered Luke at Troas. I think most commentators think that. It could have been a little bit earlier, but in and around this final movement as they're moving west, just about ready to cross over uh, the Aegean Sea by boat. And by the way, it just took them a couple of days to do it. Uh, later on a return visit, I think in chapter 20, they're going against the wind. It takes them five days, but it's got a two-day trip. They're going with the wind. It says, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, notice it says concluding. Everything about what was happening was an indication that it was now time to go into Europe. Paul had not intended to do that. He was probably going to continue on into northern Galatia. He should do that later on. Uh, but here we have a situation where it became plain. There's got to be a change of plans. And sometimes this happens. Uh, it's happened to me a few times. I had one thing that I had in mind I was going to do, and then something else entirely took place. And uh, that's just the way it goes. I never intended to be a pastor again, a pastor of the Miller Avenue Baptist Church, but God had other plans for me. <clears throat> and so 34 years later, I have to admit, uh, that was the will of God. All right. Until next time, so long.